Hello and welcome to Twynham Online. Today at Twynham, Emma Heath shares her passion for the recovery course. Would you like to be involved in a brand new initiative that has never been done before in the UK in regards to how we run the recovery course? This September, through the help of FaithWorks and the Recovery Course Nationally, we are going to be launching a cross-conurbation recovery course which is going to... and I'm taken to the seaside by Oscar to talk about Daniel. Human nature forgets life stories and history. We often want to play the risk game. Well hello it's good to be back again this week. Uh, we uh, today are getting towards the end of our series on Daniel. We're in Daniel chapter 5 this week. Uh, but uh, before we get to that, we are uh, just, well, I'm just going to share um, some notices with you. Uh, Lockdown Cafe obviously is still on. We are now, just a reminder, we are now only meeting two days a week, a Tuesday and a Thursday from 10 o'clock until uh, half past ten. You're very, very welcome to join us. Uh, the key is on the uh, front page of the website and you can get in through that or alternatively get in touch with me uh, or with Sue in the office. That's office at twinehamchurch.org if you want to get through to Sue uh, and ask for that key. That's, uh, that will, You'll be very welcome to come along. Letters from the Lockdown are still being produced and this week Liz Crockford uh, has produced uh, the Letters from the Lockdown. Uh, so do uh, make sure you get a copy of those and use those in your quiet time. Uh, so those are basically our only two notices for this week. The other thing I, I want to say is if you want to give uh, to the work of Twynham Church, um, then you are very welcome. We'd love for you to be able to do that if you can. Uh, there is a link in the description below uh, the uh, page here that will take you to our uh, administration, secure administration site where you can make a gift. That's only if you'd like to. Uh, it's an uh, uh, opportunity just perhaps to give uh, to the work that we're doing here uh, at the church. I'm not going to say anything more uh, now other than to welcome Emma to uh, just share a little bit about uh, some of the new work that's going on with Recovery Course. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Emma. Uh, Emma has been fantastic at just leading us uh, into uh, a discovery of what it means for those people who are addicted to find release and uh, freedom from addiction. Emma herself struggled with uh, alcohol addiction for many years. Uh, no alcoholic is ever free of alcoholism, but uh, she's got an amazing testimony and it's well worth hearing that sometime. But here she is now just showing some of the new things that are going on with the recovery course. Would you like to be involved in a brand new initiative that has never been done before in the UK in regards to how we run the recovery course? This September, through the help of FaithWorks and the Recovery Course Nationally, we are going to be launching a cross conurbation recovery course, which is going to be centrally facilitated online. We are looking for churches to come together with the minimal resources that they need in order to get this course running all over Bournemouth Christchurch and Paul. You're probably wondering what's involved with this concept, which is very exciting. Well, you'll be pleased to know it's actually a lot less than if the recovery course was running individually in a church. Everything is centralised, so everything's going to be online. We'll have prayer time for the teams at half past six. At seven o'clock, we will have the start of the course and there'll be an introduction by myself and some of my team. And then it will go into a testimony. The great news is the testimony will be across um, people from all over the country and some amazing like talks. And then we will go into the videos, either the ones that myself and Justin Rees Larkin did, or it will be Nigel Scalsey, the founder of the recovery course. 
Also then, we will have breakout groups. So depending on what the church wants to do, your individual church, you could even meet in person if we're allowed to by then and have some small groups running or it will be continued online but in a separate group. In regards to how many people you need on the team, it's great news because you only need one male and one female leader and one male and female helper because we have single sex groups. We'd also want a minimum of two people for the prayer team and we'd also ask for some people that just genuinely have a heart to journey with people. So we call them recovery buddies. So we'll do a bit of training before then if we have people that want to do that. And that means that the individuals, the guests coming into the course can actually have people to support them along the journey as a friend, which is really important. But that person supporting them knows a bit more about the boundaries involved, the safeguarding elements, things like that. We've been in touch with the council in regards to safeguarding for this online concept. So we've got a lot of information about that. We'll be running training days before, not days, just the odd um, evening. Um, we'll have a complete program of training that is available to do this and for those of you that maybe just think maybe this isn't quite the right time for the re recovery course if you just want to know a bit more you can still tap in and learn along the way with us if that is what you want so there's loads of options it's so exciting we would love it if you as a church want to join this brand new innovative concept across Bournemouth Christchurch and Paul so we can see lives absolutely transformed and set free at the moment, the pandemic of addiction toppled with the pandemic of COVID, toppled with isolation, and isolation is a key factor in addiction. So all of it is this catalyst to, to a horrible thing happening around addiction. So we have an opportunity to step in, fill the gap and help. I'm sure you'd all want to pray uh, for Emma and the work she's doing with her team. Uh, there's so many people uh, struggling with addiction uh, in this area and across the nation uh, and she's been uh, valiantly helping to enable people to find a way uh, to be released from that. Uh, I'm just going to read a passage from scripture to you now, an opportunity just to, uh, to share and reflect. So uh, if you want to go and get your Bible, then you can do, and we will just have a time uh, to share some scripture before we move on into a time of worship. Psalm 77 says this, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands and my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered you, O God, and I groaned. I mused, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night, and my heart mused, and my spirit inquired. Will the Lord reject us forever? Will he never show us his favour again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed me for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years of the right hand of the Most High I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O Lord, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the sky. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Your ways through the mighty waters though your footprints were not seen. 
you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Uh, it's a interesting psalm, isn't it? Because it's a psalm uh, that seems on the surface to be quite negative. The psalmist is really struggling with life and he's really finding distress in his moment and it's uh, affecting him so badly he's finding it difficult to sleep and it's interesting that uh, that this says that because one of the things I've noticed recently on the news is that uh, so many people during this uh, coronavirus pandemic are finding it difficult to sleep that they're tossing and they're turning and they don't know what to think and they don't know what to do and of course for some people, that's a very real uh, key issue. They don't know what to do. Um, they don't know if they've got a job at the end of this. They don't know if their furlough is going to be turned back into a job or even if their businesses or their livelihoods can survive. Uh, it's enough to make a lot of people lose their sleep. And the psalmist is in a similar position here. He's talking about crying out for help. He's in trouble. He's crying out for God to hear. He's not sure whether God is listening. And he's in distress, seeking God, reaching out his hands as if God's just there, which of course he is. Um, and his soul is refusing uh, to be comforted. And he's remembering God. And he's wondering what on earth he's going to do. And he's asking some very honest questions as well. Will the Lord reject me forever? Will he never show his favour again? And perhaps sometimes, for some of you, for some some time, that's that's been your experience. You're wondering whether God is ever going to show you favour again. And, and the psalmist was struggling too. Will God ever smile on me again? Will he ever show his mercy to me again? Will he ever come close and draw near to me again? He's in such a lost place. And this is a struggle for him. But the thing he does... And the thing I find most helpful here is that he turns and he looks back at what God has done. And sometimes when we are struggling to see the promises of God for the future, we start to be troubled and we think, well, where is God in the future? Actually, sometimes when we need to stop, to, when we are going through these things and we need to stop, we don't need to look into the future and think, where is God going to be in this? Actually, the thing we need to do is to look back and say that God was in that. Uh, and in this case, he's looking back. He's looking back quite a long way. He's looking back to Moses and Aaron and them traveling through uh, the Red Sea and the promises of God in the Red Sea. But often we don't have to look back that far. We can look back quite a short distance and actually see what God has done in our lives and recognize that his promises were firm and secure then, that they will be firm and secure in the future and so if you're going through a difficult time today I would just encourage you as we go into a time of worship and to time of prayer short time of prayer uh, to say Lord I don't want to look forward at the difficulties that are coming I want to look back and to stand firm on the promises that you've made for me uh, in scripture and in my life directly and I want to just focus in on that and uh, as we just come into the presence of God now, just to calm our hearts, to calm our spirits, calm ourselves down as we, as we enter that place. Let's just know the Lord's peace in the midst of all that's going on now. Father, we just want to thank you that we can be here this morning, or this afternoon, or whenever we're watching this. Father, that you are with us, you are not far away. Lord, we might feel in a place of turmoil, we might be struggling with our sleep, we might not know what tomorrow brings, but help us, Lord, to look backwards, to look back at what you've done in our lives, to look even further back and see what you've done in other people's lives, what you did in touching the lives of people in the scriptures, what you did in terms of fulfilling your promises to your people. Father, we thank you that you will not let us down even in the midst of all we're going through, even if everything is stripped away from us, you will still never leave us or forsake us. And we thank you that we can come into a place of peace. In that place of peace, we can know your grace, your love, and your majesty. We thank you in Jesus' name.
Oh 
taken from Daniel chapter 5, the writing on the wall, verses 1 to 9, and then we'll break and read again from verses 22 to the end of the chapter. So Daniel chapter 5. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared, and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed round his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. 
so King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. So then he sends for Daniel and Daniel tells him what the writing means. So verse 22. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honour the God who holds in your hand your life in his hand and all your ways. Therefore he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription what it, that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. Here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed round his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. When we come to this chapter, chapter 5 of Daniel, we're in a different place altogether. We cast forward from the last chapter, and this now is the very last day of what became known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar from the last chapter is now dead, and we're perhaps a couple of generations further along the line. The new king is Belshazzar, and Belshazzar was at a party, and he was getting very, very drunk. And as with all people who get very, very drunk, he got very, very foolish and did very, very stupid stuff. In this case, the king orders that the vessels that were used uh, in the Temple of Jerusalem, in the most sacred place, the most holy place, should be brought out of storage and used at his party. And the outcome is very weird indeed. A hand appears in midair and gouges a message in the plaster work opposite him. He's terrified at this hand, ghostly in nature, from disembodied fingers really. But the message in the wall is written so everyone can see it. The king is panicked and he seeks out an interpretation. It's an interesting story on, on many levels and for many reasons. The Bible account actually doesn't give the context. And the context itself is that the Babylonian Empire has been crumbling for weeks, for months. Cities have been falling and some of them peacefully, without shots fired, as they say these days. And because the Babylonian Empire has been falling so easily, the Medo-Persian armies are now pretty much at the gates of Babylon. But then we have the king. And what's he doing? Well, while that's all going on outside the palace, inside he's having a party. His view seems to be, well, let's party. Let's have a great time. Uh, it'll all be okay tomorrow, but it's not going to be okay tomorrow. He thinks that life's just going to go back to normal, but everything is about to change. I don't know what you think about normal at the moment. I, I think perhaps for many at the beginning of the year, uh, there have been 
most of us would take a similar view really that 2020 was going to be much like 2019. The news was going to be about Brexit in some format. There were going to be some nasty things happening as so often do. But much was not going to change. Economically, we're on a reasonable footing, moving in a similar direction to the previous year. And suddenly, everything changes. I mean, look at us now. The message, or the passage indeed, uh, portrays that everything's changing for Belshazzar. And it reminds me of another passage in the New Testament. At the end of the New Testament, in the book of James, in chapter 4, and James says this, he says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there and carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and we will do that or this as it is you boast in your arrogant schemes all such boasting is evil james here is warning us that to assume that all's going to remain the same and will not be changed and will not be challenged is foolishness and that we should think again this year we couldn't have conceived of what was going to happen. The huge changes that were going to face us, the huge choices we were going to have to make, and indeed the British government was going to have to make in choosing between jobs and human lives. This week, the loss of 600,000 jobs is countered by the prediction that if we'd done nothing, we would have lost 500,000 lives. And we've had to face so many changes. The closure of the church, which is why I'm preaching on the beach. The separation of families, businesses under threat, jobs on the line, all in just three months. And we're reminded really of our frailty, of our weakness, of our lack of control and power. I think in a way, We've been humbled by this. For Balthazar in chapter 5 uh, of Daniel, he seems unconcerned, blasé, even reckless. You'd think that taking the temple cups perhaps would be a normal thing for a conquering king to do. But actually, in Babylonian culture, as many other Middle Eastern cultures and ancient Near Eastern cultures, taking something from somewhere and using it when it's supposed to be sacred, would never have been done. So he's pretty out there when it comes to his behavior. It's unusual even for him. He seems unconcerned that the army's at the gate and he seems unconcerned as to what the gods of the heavens think. He's too busy just having a party. When Daniel steps into the room, the partying mood is over. The king is now white as a sheep, and perhaps comically his knees are knocking together with fear. The first thing that Daniel wants to do is to draw his attention to the things that have happened in the past, particularly to his father or grandfather, we're not sure which, Nebuchadnezzar who in the last chapter was brought to his knees from pride through madness and spent seven years living as pretty much a hermit and it humbled him. Like Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar had suffered from pride and God had taught him a lesson that the God of Israel was all-powerful. Not just some local god, he was Yahweh, the king of the universe. And that needed to be acknowledged, and Nebuchadnezzar did so. Nebuchadnezzar would never have touched the goblets from the temple in Jerusalem. 
he knew better than to do that. The problem with Balthazar was that he'd never bothered to get to know any of this. He hadn't bothered to get to know the history and why things were the way they were. He seemed unbothered, disinterested, like someone who's not interested in any form of history. Lessons from the history books weren't learned. And he thought he knew better than everyone. In fact, the reason that God's judgment fell so quickly on Belshazzar as it hadn't done on Nebuchadnezzar was indicative of the, of the probable reason that he knew all of this stuff, but he failed to act on it at all. But we're like that, aren't we? Human beings don't tend to learn from history. We tend to repeat it. In Italy, in AD 70, two towns, one called Herculaneum, another one called Pompeii, were totally destroyed when a volcano called Mount Vesuvius exploded. Now you would have thought with all that had been recorded that no one was going to be stupid enough to build houses on Mount Vesuvius. But you only have to think about where Naples is placed today. Human nature forgets life stories and history. We often want to play the risk game. I don't know if you've ever played the game Pass the Bomb. It's a word game where people get to uh, take a turn, think of a word and pass on this ticking device that's supposed to be a bomb. And the last person to hold it, it explodes and they're out of the game. We can be like that sometimes, but our history will not dictate our future. You know, I'm always amazed when I go down to the shops and I stand in line as I come out and I see the people queuing at the tobacconists. They're queuing to buy two things, a packet of cigarettes and a lottery ticket. They do this in the true belief that they will neither get cancer and they will win the national lottery. That's crazy. You've got a 30% chance of getting some disease from smoking. You've got a 5 million to 1 or 50 million to 1 chance of winning the lottery. The whole reason that the cups were out at the party is because Belshazzar thought he knew better than his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar. He thought he knew better. He thought he knew what he needed to do and that because he did it this way this time, things would be different. You know, Albert Einstein used to say that a fool is defined as someone who does the same experiments in the same way and always expects different results. The whole reason that the cups from the temple were in Babylon to start with was because of pride. The pride of another king, this time King Hezekiah, one of the kings of Judah, who in pride showed the Babylonians all the treasures of the kingdom. Hezekiah got away with it. He passed the bomb on. He got away with it. But when King Jehoiachin was on the throne, the bomb exploded. You can read about that in 2 Kings 24 verses 12 to 14. We need to learn from history. We need to learn from the wisdom of others. We need to be humble if we're not to take up the bomb and risk it blowing up in our hands. And anyway, why should we have to relearn all this stuff over and over again as if something has changed that's going to make the outcome different? When it comes to the writing on the wall, it's interesting too. I'm interested because contrary to popular belief, the king didn't know what had been written. And he doesn't ask what's been written on the wall. He asks what it means. I think he knew what it said. I think the words were not unfamiliar. Mine is a unit of currency. 
a unit of currency that should add up to a shekel, a tekel. And that, a tekel, a shekel, is another unit of currency. And Daniel notes the meaning here as being that the money, it just doesn't add up. Mine, mine is not making a tekel. And the lacking, and the, or it's lacking or it's wanting, everything is crooked and it doesn't line up. The prophets in Israel and in Judah hated the dishonest scales, going on and on about it. Here too, things aren't adding up and it's a problem. What was missing was the humility that Nebuchadnezzar had learned. Belshazzar should have known the history and should have followed it. He was surrounded by teachers as a young man and he should have been able to learn from them. He would have learned the history. He would have learned the culture. But he's chosen not to. He's chosen to leave it all behind. The problem for Belshazzar is he wants to be proud. He wants to be different. He wants to break the mould to be remembered. He's not interested in spiritual matters. And that's why he gets the cups out, because he doesn't care. He didn't listen to the teachers who surrounded him. And now the armies are surrounding him. Now he finds himself being judged because the scales of history do not add up. As Paul says, we're all affected by this condition of pride. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. We don't want God in the middle of our lives. We want to go our own way. We want to be independent. We want to be proud. We want to make a difference. We want to be different to everyone else. Perhaps unlike Belshazzar, we don't want to do it all alone anymore. We want to come back. But the way of coming back is, is not by trying to just do good things anymore. We need more than that. Our lives don't add up. We need someone in our lives to make it add up again. Passing in this passage means that everything's going to be divided up. Well, why would that be the case? Well, it will be the case because the person who owns it is dead. For Belshazzar, he should have known, he should have learned, he should have stuck with what his grandfather, his ancestor Nebuchadnezzar had learned, that he'd humbled himself and acknowledged God as Yahweh. He grew up with that teaching, but he chose to party on. And now it was judgment day, and he'd not see another day. He died that day. I think all too often we don't think about tomorrow. We don't think about the consequences of our lives and the way that we lead them. You know, we could die tomorrow and that's been made very clear to us by what's been going on in the world. There's a disease that can make that happen. We call it coronavirus, but equally there's another disease at work in our hearts and lives. And that disease is even more dangerous than coronavirus. It's sin. Sin is the pride of thinking that we can do better than God, live our lives out in our own way. Six months ago, if I told you you could die tomorrow, you would probably have said to me, only if a bus hits me or I have an accident. Today, you'd recognise that there will be other reasons why that might happen. We can't live every day like it's going to happen and everything's going to be the same. Our life, like James says, is a mist. And when the sun comes up, the mist disappears. Don't waste a moment. Don't waste a, don't waste a moment of your life. Pray humble yourself and come to God. The writing's on the wall for all of us. We've all been weighed. 
we are all wanting. But if we invite Christ into our lives, if we invite Christ back into our lives and we walk with him, then that can make a difference. I want to invite you today, if you don't know Jesus, to consider him. Perhaps to get on your knees before your television or your computer screen today and say, actually, I don't want to be like Belshazzar. I don't want my life to be marked out with pride. I want to know Jesus. 40 years ago, I didn't know him either. 40 years ago, I was growing up in an atheist family where no God was involved. And we lived our own lives and drunkenness and that kind of behavior probably wasn't uncommon for us either. But I met with Christ and he's made a difference for me. So I'm gonna just pray and we're gonna ask Jesus into our lives again, afresh for some, for the first time maybe for you. And we will do that now. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I don't want to live my life this way anymore. I want to come to you. I want to give my life to you. Lord, I want you to come in and I want you to get rid of all the stuff in my life that's filled me with pride of my own life and achievements. And I want to ask you to come in and make me clean on the inside. I don't just want you to come in and go away. I want you to come in and stay. I want to live with you knowing your grace, your favour, your love and your peace in my life. And I want you to get involved in my life and make a difference in my life and make my life into the thing that it should be. Lord, will you change me? I welcome you in as my saviour. I also want you to be Lord and to rule. Come, Lord Jesus, come into my life now. Amen. You know, if you've prayed that prayer for the first time or something similar, then can you let me know? Right in the bottom, under the description, there's some comments. Let me know that you've prayed that commitment to Jesus and that you want to give your life to him. But don't wait another minute. Don't wait another second. If you haven't let him in, if you didn't pray then, wind it back go through it don't wait a minute we don't know what tomorrow brings we all of us are a mist we all of us are fragile we, all of us don't know what tomorrow brings and we'll bless you we'll keep you make his face to shine on you and we'll give you his peace Love demands 
in grandeur and see the growth and feel the gentle breeze then sings my song my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my my Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art When well, then I think What God is Son of Spirit Send him to die I scarce can take him Then sings my soul, my soul.